Okay, so I'm here to talk about Black Hat Python. So I was up in Thunder Bay working, um, stuck in my hotel room, and one night I got a text message from my good buddy, Justin Seitz. And he was like, yo, 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 yo. And I was like, yo, because we're cool. We talk that way. And he was like, big news, man. I, I'm writing a, a new book. And I was like, cool, because his first book was really awesome. And he was like, want to be a tech reviewer? And I was like, what the fuck is that? And he's like, well, it's where you read the book, um, fix all my code, and don't get paid for it. And I was like, YOLO, because sometimes I text like a 12-year-old girl. Fast forward to about a month ago. Whoa. We're... Fast forward to about a month ago, and he was like, okay, we're done. And I'm like, thanks, sweet Jesus. Because um, to no starch's credit, they did end up paying me and the other tech reviewer, but holy crap, that was a lot of work. So the book is at the printers right now, um, and it's going to be available in a couple weeks. But I wanted to take this opportunity to um, get you guys, if you're not, uh, if you don't know Python, maybe thinking about learning it, or if you know it, maybe using it more in pen testing for stuff you hadn't thought of before. So these are some of the examples from the book that I thought were really cool. Um, so first, the obligatory why Python slide. I think we've been over this, but uh, it is really powerful. And I think that some of the power comes from the simplicity of the language, right? You're not stuck worrying about like semicolons and wrapping everything in squiggly brackets um, or dollar signs in front of the variables. So that lends itself really well to um, being able to, when you run into a problem, quickly um, write up a new tool just on the spot to solve that problem, okay? Uh, it's cross-platform. It runs on Windows and everything else. A lot of people will say, well, it doesn't come out of the box on Windows, but you can get around that with stuff like Py to exe So you can take your script and make it an executable. Or if the machine has Java on it, uh, and we all know that that's installed on 3 billion devices, uh, that's a sign of the apocalypse, by the way. Um, then you can, you can run your Python script inside of the JVM. So that's kind of neat. And of course, it's been widely adopted by the InfoSec community, so, whoa, it keeps skipping. You can leverage the stuff that people have already done. So here's the first example. Um, and it's a really basic one, uh, admittedly. But, so Netcat is great for doing a quick and dirty interactive shell on a system, right? But the problem is AV has kind of figured that out. So. What if we um, replicate that functionality just using pure Python to avoid antivirus? So to do that, uh, we'll need a server piece that's going to just sit there listening on a port. Um, and it's going to handle the, the connections coming in. So we'll, it'll be able to like receive a file, um, run a command, and return the result, or just do like a full-on interactive shell. The client part is obviously going to want to connect to that. It's going to want to send a command, um, receive and print the response out. And if it's a shell, it's going to want to do that a whole bunch of times. Um, digging into the code, and I was assuming bigger monitor, but whatever. Uh, here's the server part. You can see it's really simple. We're just using the, um, the socket module to set up our listener. Then we're using the threading module um, to spin up a new thread to handle requests coming in. So we can sit there listening and handle the client requests coming in at the same time. On the client side, again, we're using the socket module to send data. And then this is how we're running uh, system commands. It's just the subprocess module. Uh, the check output function will give us a string back of the output. And I learned last year that uh, I get what I call presentation fingers. Uh, so I can't type where the shit in front of an audience. 
Um, so I pre-recorded all the demos just to avoid that. <laughs> so here's the demo for the Netcat replacement. Uh, this is an XP, this is the victim machine because um, I'm too cheap to pay for Windows 7 on my lab. And we're just running the script and we're telling it, hey, listen on port 5555. And we're giving it the dash C so that it's going to fire up a command shell. And then the attacker machine is connecting to the target on that same port. I'm a slow typer. <laughs> yeah, there we go. And then it's going to drop us into this um, Black Hat Python shell. And then from there, we can just execute Windows commands like we were on the box. And right now, I'm just um, spitting out the contents of boot I and I, just for demo. And that is it. So there's one use for you. Um, the next thing that I thought was really neat, and I'd never done it before, is uh, extending the burp uh, suite. So if you're not familiar, burp suite is like this really great web application testing tool. Um, and it has this ability to uh, be extended. It's kind of like a plug-in architecture, right? And because it's Java-based, I didn't realize that you could write your modules or your, uh, your extensions in Python, but you actually can. So uh, for this example, what we want to do is take all the stuff that's gone through Burp, take all the web, con like the HTML content for a website, and turn that into like a password list that we can use to like crack, crack passwords. So the idea is if you're testing an organization, you just spider out their website and this will turn it into a password list. Of course, there are other tools that will do this, but if you're already working in Burp, it makes sense to do it here. So to get this to work, there's some like boilerplate code you have to write. Um, and then there's going to be a, we write a helper class that's going to strip out all the tags for us and just leave us with the, like the contents of the page. Uh, and then we're going to take that and kind of just do some simple um, stuff that a user would do when they're making their password, like, you know, put a, a one at the end or the current year, stuff like that. Um, and then just some other points. You have to tell Burp where your Jython jar is. Well, that'll show, I'll show you that in the demo. And I got stuck on this in Kali. It runs uh, Burp with Java 6. You don't want that because Jython doesn't operate that way, so you've got to run it under Java 7, but that'll be in the demo part too. Um, so for the code, you can see at the, the top two lines, we're just importing um, stuff from the Burp API. So every extension needs to implement the Burp extender interface. It'll, and because we want a context menu, like when you right click on something in Burp, we want our extension to show up in that list. So we're also importing the context menu factory. The bottom three lines are actually, we're importing Java packages. Um, so something, we're importing from Swing so that we can deal with the UI and some other stuff. But the reason we're able to import Java packages is because we're running in Jython and not Python. And Jython is like a, a, a Python implementation in Java. So you have access to both Python modules and, and Java packages. Uh, this is the boilerplate code that I was talking about. So my, uh, we got a class here that's, ex that's uh, what do you call it, inheriting from burp extender and context menu factory. And then the second line there that's highlighted, we have to define this function called register extender callbacks. And that is our way of like telling Burp, hey, we're ready to rock. Um, yeah, this is the this is the small helper class that's going to rip out all the all the tags and leave us with just the straight up website content. So it's inheriting from HTML parser, and the way it works is you just write these functions that get called every time it's reading the HTML, and We'll take the, the comments, like developer comments, right? Or the, the words on the page, and we're just going to jam them into um, a list for later. 
And this here is a really simple mangling function. It's just going to tack some stuff on the end of the words that we find, or it'll capitalize the word and then do the same thing, tack, tack more words on. Um, so here's the video of that. So the first part of this is me trying to remember the path to Java 7 on my Kali Linux box. Um, so I'm just looking through my history. Hey, there it is. Cool. And if my computer is faster, okay. There's burp. So I'm just making sure that the traffic I'm sending through my browser is actually going through the proxy. Nope, it's not. Uh, now it is. Cool, there it is. So first thing is we, once that's happening, we spider the whole website. So we make it crawl everything and get all the HTML pages, right? And I'm just sitting here waiting for that to be done. Okay, and then after that's done, now we're going to go to the extender tab, very top right there. And you go to the options section, and you make sure you're pointed at the Jython jar. And then you go to the extensions tab, and we're going to add in our, our Python code. You switch this here to Python. You give it your script that you've written. And you have the option of putting standard output to a file, which would help us in this case because we want a password list. But just for demo, I'm going to um, show it up in the, in the user interface. Through the magic of open source video editing, we are speeding ahead. But that, was, that gray thing, I didn't know how to get rid of. All right, so we go back to all the requests. We highlight all of our requests. And then when we right click, our, our new extension is in this list, create word list. So that's cool. That's going to run. And more video editing magic is going to happen. <laughs> All right, and we're back. OK, so now we're at the extensions tab again. And you can see very bottom of the screen, when we go to the output tab, it's going to give us the output from our, our extension. And you can see very bottom, it's created this password list for us. So it's kind of neat, kind of cool. But you can do lots with, uh, with Burp and Python if you're so inclined. OK, for the third uh, example, um, Justin had this idea for command and control using GitHub. Because GitHub, like if you're, well, if you're, writing uh, Trojans, as he often does. Um, one of the problems you're going to struggle with is like, hey, it's out there, but I want to update the code, right? So what's really good at updating code? Well, Git. Git's a way to push code, right? So let's use GitHub to, uh, as a channel for command and control. Pretty cool idea. To make that work, you're going to have to write a Trojan that can talk to GitHub. It's, it needs to pull down its commands, run them, and then push back the, the data that it's gathered from the, the victim host. Uh, we want it to be modular, so like you can have certain commands for certain machines. And, and even the commands for those machines, it's not going to download some command that it doesn't need, right? So all the commands are modular. And the really neat part is we. Uh, we have to hack Python's um, import functionality so that it will be able to, when it's trying to import a module, we jump in and we go get it from GitHub, right? So that's a really neat feature of this. Uh, in terms of the code, we're importing from GitHub, the GitHub 3 module. So you can Google that if you want to use it. Um, the second line. There, we're just setting a Trojan ID. So it's like a unique identifier for our, our victim host. And then the other thing to note here is we're using JSON for the configuration file. This, mod uh, this function is for connecting to GitHub. So you basically just give it a username and password, and then you tell it what repository you want to access and the branch, and that's it. 
This, is, this uh, method is for actually getting a file off of GitHub. And it's, I don't know, it just does it. Uh, these, the top one is the config file, so it's pretty simple. But it lists like the commands we want the Trojan to run. So the top one is, OK, a directory listing. And the second one is just give me all the environment variables. And the bottom listing here is just the, the one that spits out the directory stuff. Um, and this is the, the meat and potatoes of the um, kind of stepping in and, and getting Python to um, import our own code. So basically, the way it works is the Trojan is going to want to import one of our modules, like directory lister. But that's not in the built-in Python install. So we can kind of insert ourselves in the process and get called. So when the interpreter is looking for the module, it'll end up asking us, hey, do you know where this module is? And we go out to GitHub and grab it, and then bring it down. And it gets imported, and the interpreter runs it. So it's kind of powerful, pretty cool. And so this is the demo for that. So this is the victim again. So it's got its config, it's looking for the modules, then it's running them, and then it's pushing the results back up to GitHub. So that's done. Now I'm going to switch to the attacker machine. Any second now. And you can see this is the repository it was pushing to. So now there's a new data folder up here with ABC, which is my, my victim machine, and the results of those two commands. So there's two files in here. They're base64 encoded. Uh, there they are there. And so I'm just going to pull that stuff down from GitHub. Type faster, Dan. OK, there it is. And then just real quick, hopefully quick, I am going to base64 decode that stuff and just spit it out so you can see it. And I'm going to um, change, the, change the commas to new lines just for visibility. Biggity bam! All right. And I'm going to skip the end. Like, this is taking way too long. So that's done. Cool. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much the stuff that I have. But there's a lot more in the book that um, I want to draw your attention to. There's sniffing with Scapy. There's, he does a really cool chapter where um, he's exfiltrating data through, I, through Internet Explorer. And he's got it all encrypted with uh, public key cryptography, and posting it on a Tumblr blog. So that's pretty crazy. Really cool chapter. Uh, VMware sandbox detection, so you can figure out if you're running inside of an analyst machine. Um, there's a really kind of novel privilege escalation thing in there. Um, that's It's safe, and it's easy. Um, that's neat. And then the last chapter, he's backdooring virtual machine memory, like he's injecting shellcode into snapshots of a virtual machine's memory, which is pretty sick. So yeah, um, check out the book and all the slides and the sample code. So I know it's hard to see that the sample code is on my blog um, or my GitHub, and you can probably get it from the B-side site as well. So thanks a lot, guys. Thank <laughs> you.